Hello everybody and welcome to another of Alan Robson's Grizzly Tales and a number of tales we have to tell. Now last week we got stuck into weird and horrible and downright peculiar ways to pop your clogs. And you know there were so many of them, we're going to take a visit down that road again. Now you've all heard the story of Grigory Rasputin. In fact, if you haven't, robsonsworld.com, I travel all the way to Moscow and St. Petersburg to track down the full, unexpurgated story, a story you don't hear often. You hear snitches and snatches, but the real deal you can get on robsonsworld.com and it will blow your mind. The mystic was becoming a total annoyance, so Prince Felix Yusupov was invited to his place and they gave Rasputin a load of tea, some cakes, and a couple of bottles of wine that he downed on his own, and they'd all been laced with cyanide. But none of it seemed to affect him. So in frustration, they then shot him in the chest, and he hit the ground. They thought he was dead, but after a while, he leapt up, put his hands around the throat of Prince Yusupov, and tried to kill him. Now, the prince was lithe, Rasputin was wounded, so he did manage to shake him off. Rasputin followed him, made it into the courtyard where Yusupov shot him again, and he collapsed onto a snowbank, and he was still alive and breathing strong. So Yusupov and his pals wrapped his body in a blanket and dropped it into the Malaya Nevka River, a fast-flowing river that was mostly frozen over. They tried to follow his body as the river wended its way downstream because they could walk on the ice. And all the way for almost a mile and a half, Rasputin's eyes were open and he was pounding on the ice to try and get out of it. It did eventually kill him. Now, that sounds horrific and shocking, but it's not close to the shocking things he did from the age of a child up until that point. Robsonsworld.com, check that sucker out. You will love it. Now, Frank Hayes was a jockey. He was only 22 years of age, and he was riding a horse in New York City, and he had a heart attack mid-race, collapsed forward onto the horse, and the horse crossed the finish line first, carrying his dead body. Lots of other weird, strange things, like the story of a lawyer from Bangor in Wales. His name was Thornton Jones, and he woke up to find that he had his throat slit. He asked a member of his family for a paper and a pencil, and he wrote, I dreamt that I had slipped my own throat, and I woke up to find it was true. And then he died. He did it while he was asleep. An American stunt performer called Bobby Leach, he died after a botched amputation of an infected leg that he'd broken, slipping on an orange peel. You can't make these kind of things up. Death by Big Dicky Bird? Doesn't sound likely. But in 1926, a 16-year-old called Philip McLean and his brother were tr trying to club a cassowary to death. Now, cassowaries are like ostriches. They're huge, big birds. His family property was in Mossman in Queensland, Australia. The cassowary didn't take friendly. They thought of somebody hitting him on the head with a wooden club. So when it knocked him down, the bird kicked him in the neck, opening a huge cut, leading to a death from loss of blood. Casuaries have got huge claws on their feet. Okay, aviators over the years have bit the dust in a lot of spectacular fashions. But what about Nicholas Comper? He was not just an aviator, he also designed aircraft. And it was bonfire night. And he was attempting to light a firework in Hythe in Kent. When a passerby inquired what he was doing. Comper replied that he was an IRA man and he was going to blow up the town hall. So the passerby smacked him in the face to stop him. 
He hit his head on his curb and he died. He was not an IRA man. He was not planning to blow up the town hall. He was just a bloke trying to light a Roman candle and it cost him his life. Now in general, we're not a very careful lot. Sherwood Anderson is proof of this. He was a writer responsible for a load of very big selling books in the States. And he died of peritonitis. What caused it? He used to always go around with a toothpick in his mouth and he must have thought it made him look interesting or, or tough. One day he accidentally swallowed a toothpick. It got infected inside his stomach and wouldn't pass and he died of peritonitis. I suppose we should stay in the whole area of flying so I can tell you a story from 1948 of a guy called Thomas Mantell. Now he was the pilot of a P-51 Mustang fighter plane and he crashed in pursuit of an unidentified flying object near Franklin, Kentucky. Therefore, he became the very first person to die as a result of a UFO. Officially, the object remains unidentified, although those that don't believe in UFOs said that it was a skyhook balloon sent up to tell the weather from a US Navy ship. It doesn't explain the fact that the P-51 Mustang followed this craft at high speed for over 300 miles so how fast was that balloon? Now I know that I have been stupid enough to parachute in the past and it was a completely mind-blowing experience. It is blind terror until the parachute opens and then it's kind of, oh, I'm going to live from there on down to the ground. Well, Nick Plantanida was a skydiver. He did hundreds and hundreds of parachute drops. It was his thing. He loved it. And he died four months after his attempt to break the record for the highest parachute jump. On his way down, his suit had depressurized and this in turn had caused severe brain damage. And it took his life. Now, if you're anything like me, when I was little, I watched an awful lot of weird and wonderful kung fu -y kind of things because Bruce Lee was a thing. He appeared, he, uh, he was super fit. He could do press-ups on his little fingers. He was an incredible person. He cropped up in all kinds of TV shows, including Batman. And none of that explains Harvey Thomas who lived in the United States, he became so obsessed with Batman, he decided he was going to swing from building to building. And miraculously, he managed to swing from three buildings, one after another. And then came the fourth building that was just that little bit too far. Smack, kapow, wham. None of those were the noises that he made when he hit the pavement. It was rather more of a splat. And when it comes to our own health, sometimes doing the right thing can be the wrong thing. And I feel sorry for a lady in the 1970s. Her name was Tina Christopherson. She died when she drank four gallons, 15 litres of water a day, trying to combat stomach cancer. Her doctor had recommended that she drink that much. The cancer didn't kill her but the water did. I know a lot of you like motor car races, like the Formula One and what have you. Well, Tom Price and Frederick Janssen van Vuren were drivers in the 1977 South African Grand Prix. During the race, Tom Price struck and killed Frederick Janssen van Vuren while he was traveling at 170 miles an hour as Van Vuren ran across the racetrack to try and extinguish his car that was on fire. The car hit him so hard that the fire extinguisher stuck into Price's head and killed him. 
Now, I know during sporting events, occasionally during a football match, some poor so-and-so in the crowd might get a football smacked at them at electrifying pace. If you're watching golf, you might get a golf ball hitting you firmly on the top of your head. All of those things have happened and lives have been lost because of them. But if you were watching a half-time show at Shea Stadium, which is big baseball event, John Bowen was watching the cheerleaders strutting their stuff when a 40 pound, that's 18 kilograms, a model plane that was almost as big as a lawnmower crashed into the stands, hitting him in the head and taking him out immediately. Now from time to time, we've all had a dabble in the sea of either swimming or snorkeling And on a couple of occasions, even I have had a scuba diving suit upon me. Yet the very worst and most frightening occasion was when I went into Loch Ness in an old-fashioned diving suit to act as bait for the Loch Ness Monster. That entire adventure can be heard on robsonsworld.com and it's not to be missed. It really is quite something. We decided we were going to bait the lake for a week beforehand with various things and we caught all kinds of things but not the monster so we thought it was a good idea for me to go down at midnight lit up under the boat like a christmas tree and you never believe what happened but i'm telling you the story of a man called truus helvik he was a norwegian skin diver and he was explosively dismembered in a diving bell accident. He was on the North Sea drilling rig called Bifert Dolphin. And while he was down there, the atmospheric pressure changed in the diving bell that he was in. That fired his body through a 24 inch opening. Now he was far wider than 24 inches. And that exploded his body into tiny pieces and he arrived on the surface as a shower of blood and tiny pieces of flesh and bone. It was a horrible, horrible way to go. Dick Wertheim, he was a tennis linesman and he died after a tennis ball that was hit really hard hit him in his balls, knocked him out of his chair and he didn't survive it. Now, Jimmy Ferrozo in 1983 was a bouncer at the Condo Club in downtown San Francisco. And he died having sex with his girlfriend. Now, I know a lot of people say, oh, if there's a way to go, that's the way I'd want to go. Well, he was actually on top of a grand piano that was lowered from the ceiling by a hydraulic motor so that it didn't have to be there all of the time. But while he was actually having sex with a girl, He pressed the button of the lifting mechanism and that took him back up to the ceiling, suffocated him flat, while his girlfriend, Teresa Hill, managed to just get out in time. Now I know we concentrate on human beings because they come first, unless you're a pet owner. Then of course the animal does. In this case, it's the story of Cashy the Poodle. Now, Cashi was a poodle who lived in Caballito, Buenos Aires. And this poodle, Cachi, managed to jump from the 13th floor of a block of flats and hit 75-year-old Marta Espina on their head, killing them both instantly. Now, while this happened, A woman on the other side of the street, 46-year-old Edith Sola, got such a shock, she raced across the road to try and help and was completely knocked down by a bus. A man on the bus who saw her get squashed had a heart attack and died on his way to the hospital. Naughty Cashy. And over the years... I have been guilty of many crimes and one of them may well have been with a bit being too cocky for my own good. 
I understand this, I apologize for it, but it's how you feel when you're in people's rooms every night. On the radio, you do get a bit ahead of yourself. And you can forget things because you suddenly stop being so focused about what you're doing. And such was the case of Ivan Lester Maguire. In 1988, this veteran skydiver was filming a jump by an instructor and his student. He was going to put it on a video for his skydiving school. Now, this was all well and good, and he got great footage of the instructor going step by step through everything that the student needed to do, and both pulled their ripcord successfully and zoomed back up into the sky. And it was at this point that Ivan Lester Maguire realized that he jumped from a plane without his parachute on. Focused on getting the filming right, he just apparently forgot to put one on. He might have mistaken the heavy rig of the camera equipment for one. The tape was recovered and it played fine. He was recovered from all over the place. Now, if you've been lucky enough to travel, maybe you've been somewhere close to an electrical storm. I think they look amazing, but they're really dangerous, like many beautiful things. And Benna Chadi football team, that's 11 players from a team in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, were playing a game out in the rain, and it started to lightning a bit, they didn't think too much of it until the wet pitch was struck by lightning and all 11 members of Bene Chadi football team died. Yet every single member of the other team who wore rubber boots came out of the game totally unharmed. Now I think men, especially men, some women, but especially men, have a tendency to show off a bit, especially when you're trying to impress a woman. Well, such was the case in 1998 of Alberto Farga. He died in Lisbon in Portugal from falling out of a five-story window whilst he was performing a tango. He was on the dance floor of a dance studio and he was demonstrating to his students how to keep their head high by looking at the ceiling all of the time, never looking at your feet. And while he was looking at the ceiling, he failed to notice an open window and went straight out of it. Now there's been a few films made over the years where they put collars over people's heads and they say, oh, if you ring the police, We'll explode this collar around your neck and kill you. There's been a few sci-fi movies made where all of the prisoners had to wear one. They had to try and find a way to get out of it. Well, Brian Wells was a pizza delivery man from Erie in Pennsylvania. And he was there trying to cash a check when a bank robbery took place. And the thieves put one of these collars around his and a number of other people's necks who were in the bank. The only difference was that his collar actually exploded, blowing his head off. And another thing we've seen a lot of in movies is that thing where you get stuck in a lift door and then the lift starts to go up, taking off either a hand, a leg, a head, a torso, whatever's sticking out of it in the first place. And we all universally go, well, that would never happen. Well, in 2003, Hitoshi Nikaido, a doctor living in Houston, Texas, was decapitated when his head got trapped in elevator doors at the place where he worked, the medical center. His head was removed from his body as the elevator ascended. I bet next time you're gonna stick your hand in to stop an elevator door closing, you might think twice about it now. Now, how far would you go to make a point? 
you know, if you disagreed with a decision that the council made, how far would you go? Would you ring them up and tell them off? Would you send a stern letter? Would you get a placard and walk up and down outside the council offices? Well, you come nowhere close to David File, who on the 5th of July in 2008, David being the last resident of a block of flats that were due to be knocked down in Bishopstoke near Southampton, he decided to highlight the injustice of being forced to move out of a home that he'd had for 30 years by on camera decapitating himself with a chainsaw. It does make that letter that you wrote calling a councillor a prat a bit weak, doesn't it? So many incredible stories. A horrible one, I'm not going to name this person because it's one of those where it's alleged rather than proven. A 43-year-old Irish woman, the mother of four small children, died of toxic shock and an allergic reaction after she had sex with a German shepherd. Not actually a man called Kurt who looked after sheep, an Alsatian dog. Its owner was a bloke called Sean, and the woman and he met in a chat room for people who were interested in bestiality. McDonald was prosecuted and added to a sex offenders list. And this is the weird thing. The German Shepherd was then put into a home and rehoused with a new family. Blame me. I hope the owners were careful when they get out the bath. A man with a long name and a very short future. His name was Larry Eli Morilla Moncado. He was a 25-year-old bloke who worked in a supermarket in Iowa. And one day, he just didn't come into work. And people tried ringing him, couldn't find him. He became a missing person and people checked his apartment building no sign of him at all and then 10 years six months later they decided to revitalize the supermarket and they pulled out a cooler from the wall and there was the body of larry eli murillo moncada trapped behind the cooler and the wall his body was both mummified and cooked on the heat needed to cool the cooler. Now I'm gonna finish on this one, although I've got so many more to tell you. And it's a one that you'll probably know, or you will have heard a similar story about it. I'm gonna tell you the real story. A man called Jimmy Heseldon. He was the owner of Segway Incorporated. You know those Segways that you travel about on? He died after riding a Segway off a cliff at Thorpe Arch, a village near Boston Spa. The coroner came to the conclusion that Heseldon had fallen from the cliff when the Segway got into difficulty. It's actually quite difficult to reverse. And he tried to reverse to allow a man walking his dog get past him and the Segway on a very narrow path and went too close to the edge and he was gone. And he had not long bought the Segway company and it cost him his life. So, some horrific ways to die. I've got a few more corkers to come and I have to share them all with you because they're wild. But let's have a few more incredible grisly tales. Now my first story is about the godless people of Gotland. Now in November 1534, King Henry VIII finally broke away from Rome and he created his own church, the English church, the Church of England. Thus, it was his responsibility to take on the heretics, the witches, the warlocks, people who didn't believe in God at all. Now, many said that this was good, as the Roman Catholic Church had a great deal of power, but at a stroke, King Henry VIII took 
total control. What had started as Henry merely seeking a divorce to allow him to find a wife that gave him a son and heir, ended up in a political revolution. The whole of the north of England and the border country was a political backwater and people carried on believing what they chose until one Catholic decided to use the pulpit to voice his view. Now word of this filtered all the way down to London to the King and rather like Chinese whispers, by the time the story reached London, it sounded like there was an armed Catholic insurrection. So the King contacted his military commanders based at York, telling them to clamp down on all Northern Catholics. And this they did even when they weren't on duty, leading to what was called at the time, the Massacre of the Innocents. A family of staunch Catholics lived in a small village called Gothland, southwest of Whitby, and they were known to be the leading lights of the North Yorkshire Catholic community. On learning about them, 12 soldiers decided, they weren't ordered, they decided to visit the family and have some fun. They had often laughed at how the Catholics were being forced to knuckle down to the new Church of England. Many priests and Catholics had been put to the sword, hanged, whipped or raped, all because they dissented. They didn't want to believe in anything other than their version of what God is. So full of drink, the soldiers approached the farmhouse belonging to the family. They saw lights in the window. They saw that spiraling wisp of black smoke from the chimney that seemed to soak into the sky. They tied their horses to an old farm cart, spilling its hayload onto the ground as they drunkenly staggered towards the house. A heavy leather-gloved hand hammered on the stiff oak door until it opened with a creak. A tiny female face peered in the blackness, staring at the unshaven faces of the soldiers. Can I be of service to you, gentlemen? Enquired a timid voice. Oh, you'll serve us all right, bellowed the soldier, pushing the door open, barging into the room. A man, wearing a nightshirt, rose from a wooden chair close to the roaring open fire and stepped towards the trooper, who drew a sword and speared the man just below the heart. He seemed to hang there, rather like a marshmallow ready for a toasting. His face, knowing what had happened, yet not understanding why, nor being able to say a word. And he never would understand, for the soldier tilted his cavalry sword, allowing the man's weight to slide from his blade as he crumbled onto the wooden floor. An older woman ran in from another room, screaming loudly, and hurled a pan of boiling water at the soldiers, who were surprised and reacted savagely. They grabbed her, pushed her to the ground, and kicked her to death. The young girl had been held firmly by two of the soldiers, and as she screamed, two even younger girls in their very early teens appeared in their nightclothes from an upstairs room. Well said one of the soldiers. It seems we have the night's entertainment to hand. The girls were taken upstairs and raped over and over and over again. And after these brutish men had finished their perverted sport, they left the house, hurling fiery torches inside, burning it to the ground. No one survived the inferno and the soldiers made their way back to their encampment in Egton. But justice, like karma, has a way of catching up with wrongdoers of whatever kind. The troop left Egton to journey up country towards what is now Darlington to impress upon them the need for people to belong to the Church of England, to force people to do that. And as they reached Great Ayton, they stopped by the river to take a drink, water their horses, and rest a while. Little did they know that the water was contaminated, and almost 30 soldiers perished, along with 17 horses. 
And it's said that if you visit Great Ayton and watch the waters tumbling down that shallow river that cuts right through the town, the frothing waters echo the cries of agony from those poisoned men and horses. Colin McFadden from Middlesbrough once looked into the river on a bright sunny day in 1990 and he swears that he saw an unshaven man staring back at him. He got such a fright he refused to look a second time just in case he saw it again. And there's a saying, red sky at night, shepherd's delight. Yet around Gothland, right up until the middle 1700s, whenever there was a beautiful red sky at dusk, the people would say, Tomorrow will be fine for their roasting Catholics again. So while we're in the vicinity of Yorkshire, let me tell you the true story of the York Romans. Because there are several dozen different ghostly tours you can take if ever you visit historic York, said to be one of the most haunted of all cities. In fact, I walk a grisly trail of York on robstonsworld.com and I can take you around with me if you like. That's where you'll find it. Among the remarkable of the York hauntings are three separate sightings of an entire Roman legion marching through the cellars of shops. At a shop in the shambles, a haberdasher that was called Arkwright was shifting boxes around in his cellar when suddenly he heard marching feet from behind the wall. To his absolute astonishment, a troop of Roman soldiers then came marching past him. The Romans looked as though they had no feet, their legs appearing to be cut off at the knee by the floor as they seemed to be walking below its surface. When he reported the incident, he was scoffed at by most. But then, scientists said that the original Roman road was almost a foot lower than the cellar floor, and that would give weight to the hapless shopkeeper's story. Two identical incidents have occurred in cellars within a hundred yards of that old haberdashery shop, and so many York residents swear that they have seen many silkies and also actual full-bodied entities of Roman soldiers around the city. In 1742, a Roman soldier's armour was found buried in a pit near Bale Hill. The man who found it claimed that the body of the soldier within it was totally preserved, as if he had just died. He gathered his friends around to see the soldier. The body of the man looked barely 25 years old, and indeed he did look freshly dead. But then, right in front of their eyes, the soldier began to decompose, skin drying and flaking from the bones. The bones then began to turn to dust until there was only the armour left. The man that found it on Bale Hill was cursed and he refused to ever visit it again. The rumour continues that half a dozen members of his family died over the next eight months. Two middle-aged ladies, a Mrs. Taylor and a Mrs. Harding, were walking along Davy Gate in York early one morning in 1958 when they heard metal clattering. They thought somebody must be putting up scaffolding or something of that sort. But on swinging around and looking towards Church Street, they saw about a hundred men fighting with swords. Some were dressed as Romans, the others, they said, were dressed like tramps wearing animal skins. The ladies couldn't believe their eyes. They didn't know whether to run or to stand perfectly still and watch. Yet it was just then that the battle started to come towards them. At that moment, a delivery van honked its horn, making both ladies run back to the curb to let it pass. And after it had trundled by, there was no sign of the vision that they'd both experienced vividly. And it seems that a lot of people in the York area have experienced almost a video replay of battles in the sky around York. It's almost as if history has been captured 
and reenacts the entire story from time to time. Ray Giles from York was walking across Lendl Bridge early one Sunday morning in 1962. He saw two Roman soldiers guarding the crossing. He took it to be a student prank, perhaps connected with their rag week. And on passing, he barely glanced at them until he noticed a small Yorkshire terrier barking ferociously. It ran past him, snapping at the costumed troops and the dog ran straight through the shin of one of them and they both disappeared into a grey mist. In November 1992, war veteran Harry Gregg from Leeds was walking through the City War Memorial Gardens on Lehman Road when he saw a man wearing very little. The man was walking by the graves. He was about to shout for him to show some respect when he noticed that the man was badly wounded. He had blood oozing from a really deep stomach wound. Harry ran across to talk to the man who seemed to speak in a strange foreign language. Harry then took out his handkerchief and tried to press it into the wound to stem the bleeding. Then he looked around for assistance. When he turned back to the bleeding man, the man had vanished. Only Harry's handkerchief remained, and it was covered in blood. Incredible grisly tales, and all sworn to be true. Gonna take you to Devon next, to the story of Nelson and his lady in Dawlish. Yes, Admiral Horatio Nelson. Back in 1944, a man called Topper Henderson, who served with the Border Regiment, was returned from Italy to England, suffering a badly infected wound. He chose to spend his leave with a family of his best friend who lived in Dawlish in Devon. And while there, he had a most amazing confrontation with one of England's great heroes. Topper rang in to a phone-in show in 1987. And this, word for word, is what he had to say. I know you'll think I'm crackers, but while I was on leave, I had a hell of a job to get to sleep. For some reason, I only needed a couple of hours a night. So I used to take long walks along the sea front in the early hours. It was August, and at about 3 a.m. on a quite nasty night, I was taking my walk as usual, and I spotted this couple coming towards me. I was nearly blown off my feet because it wasn't half windy, yet they didn't seem to be affected by it at all. I really didn't expect to see anybody on such a stormy night, but there they were. As they got closer, I could see that the lady was wearing a long dress and a bonnet tied on with scarf material. The wind didn't seem to be causing her any bother at all. She was a real beauty mind. And then I noticed he was wearing some kind of dark uniform full of badges and shiny buttons. I looked at his face and I recognised him at once. It was Nelson. Now, before you say anything, no, I wasn't drunk. I wasn't even on painkillers for my wounds. It was Nelson. Mind you, he didn't have an eye patch and he still had two arms. He was holding a hand with one of them. I stared at him and it was definitely him. And he was with this beautiful girl. I was going to say good evening, but I bottled out, but I did nod at him. And he nodded back. Now at this point, as I was receiving this message, I did start laughing at him, but he kept on. He said, I knew you'd think I was daft, but it happened. It was him. I'm not making it up. I mean, you get ridiculed, don't you? You're bound to. So, suitably chastised, I continued to have a chat with him, and I have no doubt at all that this man was completely sincere, and that he genuinely believed that he'd seen Nelson. I put this to him, and he replied, when I told the Douglas family, the people I was staying with what I'd seen, they didn't pay it any heed either. But I was shot in the arm, I wasn't shot in the head. I wasn't crazy then, and I'm not crazy now. In the meantime, 
and Mrs. Harriet Smith from Dawlish was visiting the North East and she heard the show. She phoned in asking to be put in touch with Topper and we sorted that out for them. And she ended up sending him a book on Nelson and in it, a painting of Emma, Lady Hamilton. On receipt of it, Topper immediately called me back up again saying, it was Nelson, because the last with him was Lady Hamilton. I recognised that picture in the book that I've been sent. Mind you, the painting doesn't do her justice. Now what Topper didn't know is that both Lord Nelson and Emma Hamilton did visit Dawlish for a particularly romantic and passionate week together, staying at an inn on Tainmouth Road, the place that is now called the Smuggler's Inn. It seems as if those great lovers still tread a romantic path along the seafront at Dawlish in the early hours. They walk hand in hand, visiting one of their favourite holiday haunts. Now, suicide is something that you should never, ever do. Purely and simply because you never know what's around the corner. And life will always surprise you in its most beautiful and glorious ways. You must never even think about doing such a thing. And as if fate didn't conspire to prove this, I'm going to have a look tonight at failed suicides. Starting off with a famous king from back in history, King Mithridates VI. Yeah, you remember him, don't you? He ruled Asia Minor in the first 100 years BC. And he deliberately took poison. He would drink tiny doses of poison every day, believing that it would build up enough resistance for him to survive any possible assassination attempts, because most rulers ended up being killed by somebody close to them, poisoning them. So, in an attempt to take his own life rather than fall into the hands of the invading Romans, he decided to poison himself. But his body was so full of toxins that the poison had no effect at all. His body was completely immune to any poison he had taken so much. So, he ordered a slave to finish him off with his sword. Hence, the term that people still use in English, Mithridate, meaning an antidote. Okay, in 1814, Napoleon was defeated. He abdicated. He swallowed a phial of opium that he'd carried on his person for over two years, knowing that at some point, rather than go to prison, he would be happy to take his own life. He took the poison, it left him alive but screaming with stomach cramps. Then he planned to blow his brains out, but his valet emptied the powder from the brace of pistols that he always kept under his bed. Napoleon's trial at committing suicide was kept secret and only came to life in the 1930s. Let's head off to Taiwan. Huang Pinjen and Chang Shumei opted for a suicide pack when the parents of the bride refused to bless their marriage. All they did was love one another. They didn't see why anybody should mind them being together and being happy. So the couple survived three suicide attempts, including driving their speeding car off a cliff, then they tried a double hanging, and finally they both jumped from the top of a 12-storey building hand in hand, but they ended up on a roof with multiple fractures. And after that, the in-laws agreed to reconsider knowing just how much they loved one another. Nice to get a bit of true love in a grisly tale, but let's move on. Now, financial problems hit all of us, and all you can do is do your best to get out of them as best you can. And a family from Iowa 
back in the middle 90s caused seven members of the same family, the youngest age 10, the oldest age 71, to climb into a big family car, determined that they would all commit suicide because they were neither use nor ornament because they had no money left. The driver engineered a deliberate crash which ended up injuring three people in the other car but left him and his seven suicidal passengers completely unhurt and thoroughly embarrassed because now they had another bill from the insurance company. In Manila in the Philippines, Rod Gelio Aparicio, he was aged in his middle 40s, he decided that he'd had enough and he pulled out a gun and he went to the steps of his local police station and fired two shots at his own head. The police watched him do this. He missed completely with both shots and then threw the gun down and ran away crying. Now somebody else is very, very famous. Robert, Lord Clive of India. He tried to kill himself in 1744. He twice failed to shoot himself. After the second attempt, where all he'd managed to do was to scorch the hair on the top of his head, he said, it appears I'm destined for something. I will live after all. Just as well he did. In the 90s, The Lancet, you know the magazine used by doctors and nurses in the medical profession? Well, they reported that an Englishman attempting suicide had been rescued after spending more than an hour in his car inhaling car fumes, car exhaust fumes. The medical journal said that the man's try to end his own life had been thwarted by the low carbon monoxide content of the exhaust due to the new EU Community Catalytic Converter Standards. How about that? Okay, the French Emperor Louis Napoleon III had a very beautiful wife, the Empress Eugenie, the wife of a very powerful man. She attempted suicide by breaking off their heads of phosphorus matches and then dissolving them in milk and then drinking the milk. It didn't work. The composer Hugo Wolf, he was put into an insane asylum after he kept attempting to drown himself. At first, he dived head first into a fountain and tried to keep his head under water, bursting up for air at the very last moment. On several trips to the seaside, he would dive into the sea, trying to drown himself and having to be pulled out by his friends and family. And three times in his own bath, members of his family had to keep an eye on him because he kept trying to drown himself. This man was wealthy, well thought of in society and seemed to have no reason to do it, except he kept doing it. And finally, an inmate in Kansas, his name was Richard Barber, he tried to kill himself by building up the amount of dental floss that he was allowed to have to do his teeth in the morning. He tied each little bit of floss together with another bit of floss until he had a good length. Then he wrapped it around his neck and leapt off a ledge in his cell. He didn't succeed in killing himself. He only managed to cut his neck. And it was sewn up, and he was left to serve the rest of the sentence. He was in there for murdering a dentist. And all of that negative dental karma came back to stop him taking his own life and making him stay in that miserable death row cell. Well, there we have another whole selection of grisly tales. Hope you've enjoyed them, and I hope you'll come back for some more. Don't forget the book, Grisly Tales from Northumbria. 
is available should you be interested. And of course, we have robsonsworld.com loaded full of adventures for you and changing every week now. We've got a lot more coming in that direction too. Tell you more about that in time. But thank you so much for your company. Until we're together again, look after yourselves, stay safe, take no chances. From me, Alan Robson, God bless you. And I wish you well.